following podcast was recorded on Wednesday, February 17th, 2021, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606 one eight seven two. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the latest edition of Talking Data. Our Talking Data series seeks to offer timely insights into the macro market themes along with macro data and its impact on the economy and markets. I'm Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading and I will be your host today. Our presenters are Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. Today, Jim and Ben will be discussing what rising rates mean to the market. We're seeing rates around that pre-pandemic level. And we last saw, I'm gonna throw this out there, Jim, rates for the two-year note and the five-year note around late 2018 hit around the 3% mark. Are we possibly looking at anything in that range yet? Why are rates moving so, up, so fast? Yeah, uh, let me take the last part first. In late 2018, the Fed was raising rates and we did get the funds rate um, you know, back to 2.5%. That's at current rate, that's 10 rate hikes, 10 25 basis point rate hikes to get the funds rate back to two and a half percent. So if yeah, if you if if you could give me a scenario where the Fed's gonna raise rates 10 times, then yeah, we'll get the put you back to three percent. I'm having a hard time finding that scenario, at least for uh, right now. Heck, we're having a hard time finding a scenario for them to raise rates at all, uh, right. let alone that. But to to your point though, why are rates heading up? Uh, regular listeners to this podcast are not going to be shocked what I'm about to say. Expected nominal GDP, I think, is what drives the market. Expected. That's real growth plus inflation. If you get that to swell, you know, as I've said before, why is some interest rates at 10, some are negative, some are two, some are five? Because you expect over a long period of time or, or the potential of, a con of this economy is 10%, this economy is negative, this economy is four, and the rate should somewhat follow that Plus, you know, some liquidity issues and some other issues in there as well, flow issues that will kind of take the edge off of that. So the reason rates are going up is we're expecting nominal growth to be coming back. That's not an issue for me or for anybody else. I guess the real issue I have is what is the composition of that nominal growth? Is it our real growth? Reflation? I, I like to use the word reflation. Or is it I inflation? Uh, and that the, re the reality of whether or not you're getting reflation or real growth or inflation matters. Right now, the market thinks it's all about reflation. So it's okay with the rising rates. Um, and it's got its built-in excuse. The so-called base effect is coming. So if you get any kind of increase or any kind of indicator that inflation is coming back, oh, that's the base effect. We know that that's coming. So that's kind of you built in use at least for the next 90 days um, or so. If you get to a point where inflation becomes the issue, then that's where I think you're going to have problems. Benjamin, what say you? Yeah, so we have a condition where investors are, you know, excited, ready for global synchronized growth. And we're starting to get some of that. You know, we have better than 80% economy is growing above their one-year averages, meaning that that data that's coming in is above those one-year average growth rates. We have better than 80% of commodities away from precious metals uh, and energy that are actually rallying year over year. So it makes sense that the, you know, the scenario is here with the economy coming back online. We have these supply constraints to Demand is clearly um, uh, improving, as we saw with uh, with retail sales this morning coming in as a shocker, five plus percent month over month. Um, on top of that, we see producer price, uh, the producer, the PPI, excuse me, um, uh, for final demand popping 1.2 percent month over month. And so this is kind of taking away those base effects. How are things moving month over month? And we're kind of starting the year on a positive note, which I think is suggestive that uh, this inflationary force, you know, could be somewhat showing up, which is giving way uh, to higher yields, specifically at the long end. And now we're finally starting to get real rates at the very long end uh, to move. Uh, most importantly, in terms of what this means, 
I think this means investors for the first time in a long time have to care about interest rates. So they have been able to totally avoid them for the most part. I mean, think of two year notes have been stuck around 10, 15 basis points for so long um, and they haven't had any volatility to them. Volatility has been done nothing but tumble really since late 2018. But uh, as of late over the past, maybe three or four weeks, we're seeing swaps and volatility, really implied volatilities at the short end and at the long end rocketing higher. Um, and this is the largest moves uh, that we've seen in swaps and volatility across a whole entire curve, almost back to the taper tantrum. So we're kind of on this big, this big kick. Okay, inflation's coming, maybe there's inflation. Investors are saying, you've got to give me more premium for the risk taken here. Um, it, it evidenced in volatility and now also term premium turning positive for the first time since uh, November of 2018. And so again, this means you know, investors are waking up to interest rates. They're seeing the volatility, they're getting antsy. And the big question then is, did they get really antsy, uh, more so than the Federal Reserve, or do we get kind of this taper tantrum kind of scenario um, in, in the near to medium term? Or does this is this just kind of a typical cycle like we've seen, uh, a burst in vol, excitement over the global synchronized growth that kind of falls a little bit flat, nothing too exciting, and everything kind of goes back to where it was. That's kind of the big question investors have to think about. You know, just to underscore something you just said, Ben, um, when the cycle turns, you know, what do you expect if you're getting reflation? Uh, higher commodity prices, wider break evens, maybe term premiums go up. Uh, that's if you get reflation or real growth. But what if the cycle's turning and you're going to get inflation? What would you expect? Higher commodity prices, term premium to turn, higher break evens. So at the beginning of the cycle, I think it's kind of hard to tell is this the market pricing in reflation? Or is this the market pricing in inflation? Because it kind of looks the same both ways. And that's really why this is such a difficult thing. There isn't like, this is what you do when you're reflating, and this is what you do when you're inflating, and which one are we doing? Because it's kind of the same thing. It's always a matter of degree. And we're going to have to see what degree we, keep, we go with this. Kristen, what about our next question? So Ben touched on what it means for the market. Jim, what are your thoughts for what this might mean with the rising rates for the market? Yeah, I think that um, <clears throat> the simple answer I've always used is when rates start moving, um, I'll go back to the famous Jim Carville line of 1993. When I get reincarnated, I don't want to be a 400 hitter. I want to be the bond market because you could scare the hell out of everybody as the bond market. Uh, and so I think that when rates start moving, they will go to the level that matters. You know, rates are rising. And people go, when's it going to stop when it matters? It's not going to pick some random number, peak, turn around, go down, and people go, hey, I wasn't paying attention to the bond market. Did you notice that yields peaked two weeks ago and they're heading back down? And it didn't bother me when they were going up, and it doesn't bother me when they're going down. No, they'll keep going until they bother something. Either force the Fed to react to it, maybe you know, make noise about yield curve control or about extending maturities or some policy shift because of rising rates, or the bond market reacts to it. Uh, as well, or the risk markets like the stock market get bothered by it. And I just don't mean that the stock market, you know, sells off 28 points one morning and then rallies back to being down 11. That's exactly what it did today. That's why I picked those numbers. I mean, something that you would point to and say, whoa, the bond market is starting to really get, get under the stock market skin. Ben, I know you've got some numbers to put on this idea and I like them. So what are they? Yeah, so there's kind of three things I'm watching, and one that you, you know, Jim and I were talking a lot about is let's look back at, at kind of breakouts by 10-year note yields uh, over the past you know, couple decades. And every time we've had this six-month breakout to higher yields, they've always fallen flat after they've moved about 40 or 50 basis points from that breakout. Um, so we've never really pushed above 50 basis points. And if you look at the November breakout, that means that the yield point that we hit that 50 basis points is right at 1.4%. So if we can go above 1.4% on the 10 year note yield, that implies this time is different. And that means that now we're kind of in our uncharted territory. And for once we've had a bearish breakout that's actually bearish um, and actually continued. The other two things really quickly, is one, I've talked about swaps and volatility. Just think of it as implied volatility, you know, volatility expectations for the yield curve. And if you look at it on a two year out for really a two year tenor, uh, that volatility's popped a certain amount, the same amount it's popped four times since the taper tantrum. 
and that's uh, 13 percentage points. Um, and every time it's stopped there, that's where we're at right now. So it's the same thing. If we can push beyond that level and see just a little bit more, uh, a higher volatility expectation and get into taper tantrum levels, uh, that is a sign this time um, is indeed different. Um, some of the other things too that we, I think we have to pay attention to and note is the interconnection, like Jim, you were talking about, is let's look at like the VIX relative to the 10-year note or the 10-year tip break even, which is inflation expectations. Once those correlations are able to push back positive, and I'm talking about even going to zero or above, that'll be indicative of the market saying, okay, low interest rates, um, uh, you know, they were good, but now we're seeing that higher interest rates. Uh, are no longer connected the way we thought they were to risk assets and have the threat of being actually a, an impairment um, to risk assets. So watch that VIX 10-year VIX 10-year uh, tip break even. And like I've said in the past uh, past calls, is every time we poked positive, even to zero, just like Balmageddon and plenty of other scenarios in the past, we've had equity market drawdowns. Um, so I think that uh, those are some critical quantitative measures to watch. I like it because, you know, intuitively, I want to say that the bond market is either going to matter right away, like in the next week or two, or second half of this year. But, you know, the street's kind of like, oh, call me when we get to 150 to 175. That'll probably be the point where the market will be bothered. And I'm thinking to myself, now it's either going to be 140 or it's going to be 2%. It's not, <laughs> going, to be, it's not going to be that 150 to 175 that everybody's calling on. And I like what you're talking about because. You're right. We've been in a bull market in bonds, and every time we've seen it say, oh, this is it. It looks like rates are about to turn around. That's it. The, the rise in rates was over, and it just kind of fell back and went the other way. And if we get a 50 basis point move off a breakout, which you said is 140, we haven't done that, what, since the financial crisis? So that could be something that would be worthy of, of note at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, Kristen, how about our, our last question? So finally, if the, we just wanted to recap and talk about what causes these rates to stop, the rise in interest rates to stop. I, I'll just re, re recap again. <laughs> rise in rates is going to keep going till they matter, until something is caused to change. I like to say that you know market trends go until they force a change of behavior. Either the Fed is going to have to do something, uh, or the markets are, are bothered by it or something else happens along, something breaks. Because famously, we used to say, at least about the, the Fed, is that when they start hiking rates, we used to ask the question, when do they stop hiking rates? And I always used to say, when, when something breaks. They always, rate, rate, they always raise rates too much and something breaks. The last one was the uh, repo crisis. You know, they hiked rates and we had the repo, repo crisis. So, you know, to this point, I think that's a possibility, but there's also just, the stock market really takes notice. The Fed steps up uh, and takes notice as well, too. So the path to release resistance on rates is higher. Yeah, they're oversold. I mean, or, uh, you know, bond prices are oversold and we might be due for a rally. But this is like what we talked about three weeks ago. We got to 115. Yeah, they were oversold. Then they sold off the 99 basis points 15 days ago. And then we hit 133 this morning. So, yeah, we, we could see that, but I think the path of least resistance is going to continue to be higher. Ben? Yeah, I'll take a little bit different uh, perspective here. So talking about real yields. So, I mean, again, this is a space just like we have the first question you gave, Kristen. Uh, you know, real yields just haven't done anything. Uh, Ten-year real yield uh, up on the tip has been stuck around negative 90, negative 100 basis points. But now looking further out the curve, at the 30 year, we're finally getting some movement, finally. So we're, yields there are rising. I think we're around, around negative 11 basis points. Maybe we'll push positive for the first time in a very long time. If we get real yields to start moving, that's where things get really interesting and somewhat exciting because they're more connected, I think. And personally, what I've seen historically on an investing basis and that based on the numbers, they have a stronger connection to kind of like the interplay between assets um, uh, as well as industry uh, performance, relative performance. And so what I'm kind of looking for uh, there, again, is for a you know, discernible break higher, which I think will be somewhat restrictive, especially in the high yield space. We've seen yields there in the high yield corporate bond market fall below 3%, which is just amazing. Um, and I think it starts to finally become a, uh, you know, indeed a problem for them. Now, real yields right now are tracking very closely across the entire curve, even all to 30 years, uh, really kind of Fed expectations. So we've seen on the Euro dollar curve, the SEP 
22 to SEP 23 curve is all of a sudden blown out to 50 basis points. I don't know how Jim thinks about that. It seems like they're starting to pull in uh, some of the rate hike timing into 20, well into 2023. Um, and markets are doing that all on their own, well ahead of the Federal Reserve, because the Federal Reserve is still very cool as a cucumber. Um, but the more that that happens, the more real yields will rise across the entire that entire tips curve which I think is a big deal. And so you can kind of, unfortunately, you know, inflation isn't necessarily gonna guide it so much. It's gonna be this kind of real growth story, but mostly how is the Fed reacting? Are they gonna get hawkish finally? Uh, or is the market gonna force them to get, uh, you know, to, to either get more dovish in response to that hawkishness? Um, uh, and we'll see that in the real yield curve. Yeah, I'll just um, conclude on just underscoring a couple of things that you've said. I've argued the last two Fed moves were forced on them by the market. You know, that was a year ago, January of uh, 20. They had a Fed meeting. They held the funds rate at 150. They said, that's it. We're holding it at 150, uh, probably for the rest of the year, no problem. And then the pandemic hit and 15 days later, 15 days later, they cut rates 50 basis points. Um, in December of 18, the Fed comes out and says, we're going to taper 60 basis, 60 billion a month in the balance sheet. It's going to be automatic pilot, watching paint dry, no big deal. We've laid all this out. The market threw a fit. Ten days later, Paul comes out with his famous Paul pivot. Okay, we're going to be patient and flexible now. We're not going to do it. So while the market is moving forward, you're, I completely agree with you that if you see rising real yields, that that is a canary in the coal mine. But also, if the market decides it has a problem with this and throws a fit, the Fed will, I think, be forced to react to it. They did the last two times that the market's thrown a fit. That's why I famously like to say, when Rich Clarida or some other Fed official comes out and says, you know, we've done all this wonky research and we've decided that the if average inflation rate could run the two and a half percent for two years before we have to raise rates. Rich, it's not your call. It's whether or not the market will tolerate that. If the market's okay with that, then you're okay with it. But if we go to two and a half percent and the market throws a fit, you're going to be forced to react to it. So that's, you're right. I think that watching the, those those far out futures contracts, yeah, they're moving it into 2023, you know, and so it's still a ways out there. But if, it, if history, if the recent history is any guide, if something happens where the interest rates go, the market decides that there's inflation, watch how fast everything changes and watch how the Fed will be put under a white hot light and said, do something about this. And that isn't do yield curve control and try and suppress it because it might be worse. If the market's okay with it, then the Fed could not raise rates for two years. But if the market changes its mind, then you know everything can change. We'll see. Well, thank you both for your thoughts today. And thank you to our audience for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent research offerings are Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science. For more information, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com.